Welcome me to the book of Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. In the first chapter of Colossians, I direct your attention to verse 27. Notice the last phrase in verse 27, which is, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now go back to verse 25. Paul says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from angels and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this ministry among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, what is Paul saying in those verses? Well, go back to verse 25, and he says, I am made a minister. Uh, he was made a minister, that is, the word servant. In the Greek language, it's diakonos, the same word we get our modern word deacon from. And uh, the word deacon, diakonos, means a servant. And Paul is saying, uh, I am a minister, that is, a servant. And all right, if he's a servant, what is his job? In what way does he serve? All right, he tells us that in the last part of verse 25. I am made a minister to fulfill, jump down to the end of the verse, to fulfill the word of God. Fulfill, that means to uh, fill it up, to fulfill, to carry out its purpose, to deliver the message of the word of God. Now, what is that message? He isn't just talking about all sorts of messages or just any kind of message. He has a particular message in mind. What is that message? Well, look at verse 25 again. To fulfill the word of God, even the mystery. Mystery. He says, my message is a mystery. Sometimes you may think that when you hear a preacher preach. His message is a mystery. You go home and you still don't know what he said. Uh, but Paul's not talking about that kind of ministry. Mystery. Now, he's not talking about something spooky. Not that kind of mystery. He is talking about and is used to describe something nobody knows anything about. Like when you say, it's a mystery to me, which, by which you mean, I don't know, don't have any idea. And that's what Paul is talking about here. He, his message is to make known this mystery and he describes it in verse 26 the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations why this is something they didn't know about and for centuries and for millenniums nobody knew anything about this mystery that Paul was talking about but he says in verse 26 this mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest, made plain, made open so people can see and hear and understand it. Well, go on in verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery. God would make it known. The riches, this is a mystery which is rich in meaning. Uh, riches of the glory. This is a glorious truth, a glorious a mystery, a rich in thought. So what is this wonderful mystery? This rich and glorious mystery that's been hidden for ages, that people didn't know anything about in times before that. All right, let's look and see what the New Testament says about this mystery and how it describes it. We'll look at several passages. Go back to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Verse 24. Paul is talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. And the Jews being God chose, God's chosen people were to bear fruit for him but then God set them aside and started working with the Gentiles. That's the background. Verse 24, he says to the Gentiles, If thou art cut 
out of the olive tree which is wild by nature and were graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? The Gentiles cut out of a wild olive tree, makes little dinky, sharp tasting olives, grafted into a good olive tree so they could bear good fruit. And the, the Jewish branches were cut off from that good olive tree. And he goes on to explain, verse 25, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. I don't want you to be in the dark about this mystery. I want you to understand it and know it, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. And here's the mystery. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles should be come in. This mystery involves the relationship between the Jews and the Gentiles. Now let's go further. Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Paul says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. There's that same idea. This mystery's been hidden. Nobody knew anything about it. But now, verse 26, is made manifest, just like Paul said in, in uh, Colossians. A mystery hid and now made plain. Now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Here is this mystery. They didn't know anything about it. Now we're making it known. All right, we still don't know much about it yet. Go on to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 9. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 9 having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he has purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him. Well, here's this mystery that God is going to gather together in one all things in Christ. Well, that's a little more information. Go to Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 3, he says, By revelation he that is God made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, referring to what we just read. Whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Same idea, this mystery they didn't know anything about, and now I'm making it known. In verse 5, in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So what's revealed, Paul tell us. Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. That the Gentiles would be united with the Jews in one body, which we call the church. And in a church, it doesn't make any difference if some are Jews and some are Gentiles. They're one body in the church. And the mystery is this fact that the Gentiles would come into an important place in God's program. Now that was a problem for the Jews. They just couldn't see that. They just couldn't get it. Because the Gentiles, they were those idol worshipers. They were heathen. And even if once in a while one of them became a proselyte, he had to adopt all the Jewish customs and all the rest. And this idea that the, the Gentiles might be just sharing together in some of these spiritual blessings with the Jews, that was just more than they could grasp. And that was a problem for the Jews. And they couldn't get it. Remember when Peter went down to the house of Cornelius, a Gentile, and preached the gospel to them, and a whole bunch of them were saved, and word got back to Jerusalem and said, oh, what's going on? Gentiles down there getting saved. Uh, 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 what, what are we going to do? Uh, we'll send a delegation down there and find out what in the world is going on. And they sent a delegation down there uh, to Cornelius' household to find out what's happening. And Peter had to explain the whole thing to him, how the God sent him to preach to those Gentiles. Uh, they had a hard time swallowing that. 
And uh, it wasn't too many years later, they had a big meeting in Jerusalem because there was a lot of commotion that uh, uh, the Jews thought these, gen these Gentiles, if they're going to, if they're going to be in the church and if they're going to be believers in the Messiah, uh, they've got to keep those same ceremonies that the Jews did. And uh, Paul and Barnabas and Peter said, oh, no way. And they had a big discussion about it. But finally they decided, yes, Peter and Paul were right. And uh, uh, they didn't have to keep those ceremonies of the Jews in order to get into heaven. Uh, but they were having a hard time getting that. And the whole book of Galatians was written uh, to explain and impress upon these Jewish believers that Gentiles now, uh, they can be together with Jews in the church. And this is a new program for this age. And that was a mystery that they just hadn't quite get. And they finally did, but it was hard for them to get it. The idea that Gentiles could be saved as well as Jews and be one in a local church where there's neither Jew nor Gentile, bond or free, and so on, that was amazing to them. That was a mystery to the Old Testament Jews. They didn't know anything about. Now going back to Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 he says, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. A glorious truth. And he says that God would make known. The idea is that God uh, willed it. It was God's will to make this known. Paul wasn't breaking any rules by going out and preaching to the Gentiles. That's what God wanted done. And what God wanted Peter to do. And that they would go and preach to the Gentiles. And they had Old Testament scripture telling them that, but they just uh, didn't let that register. And so Paul says, this is a glorious truth to make known to the Gentiles. Now, why was, so, why was it so glorious, this truth that Paul is talking about here, along with the fact that Gentiles would be uh, fellow heirs with the Jews in the church of God? Uh, why was it so glorious? Well, because of what it is. Well, look at the verse again. Which is, this truth is glorious, which is Christ in you. It's glorious because of what it is. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, first of all, it's about Christ. Now, that's a name and a title full of meaning. Christ means, of course, the anointed, the Messiah, the anointed one of God. But look back just a few verses and notice all the different titles and the uh, descriptions of Christ. Go back to verse 14, chapter 1, verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Christ is the Redeemer who shed his blood to pay for your sins so you can have eternal life. And verse 15 He's the image, who is the image of the invisible God. He's the expression of what we can see of God, the image of God, uh, the exact image. 10,000 resolution, if you have a digital camera, of God. And in verse 15, he's the firstborn of every creature. That's not his beginning, that's his position as above all the other creatures in heaven and earth. And verse 16 says, By him were all things created that are in the heavens and the earth, visible and invisible, thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him. He's the creator of this Jesus Christ. And he is before all things. Verse 17, he is before all things. Before anything was, Christ was already there, the eternal Son of God. And also, he is the one who sustains all. Verse 17, he is before all things, and by him all things, the Greek word means held together, sustained, kept together. All these little molecules, atoms, and electrons are spinning around, and if Christ wasn't holding them together, they'd all shoot off into space, and everything would disintegrate. But he holds it all together. He's the sustainer. And verse 18, he's the head of the church. Verse 18, he is the head of the church. And also, verse 18 says he is preeminent. End of the verse, that in all things he might have the preeminence, exalted up above all, preeminent. 
and verse 19, he's the fullness. It pleased the Father that in him, in Jesus Christ, should all fullness dwell. We'll come back to that in a bit. Fullness. And he's the peacemaker. Verse 20, having made peace through the blood of his cross. You see, we were enemies of God. We were against God. We were born rebels, sinners. But Jesus Christ died and made peace by shedding his blood to pay for our sins, to bring us to God. And we sing that grand song, uh, to him I'm reconciled, or reconciled to him. He made reconciliation and made peace and reconciled us to himself, verse 20. Having made peace through the blood of the Christ by him to reconcile all things unto himself. Well, this one. The Redeemer, the image of God, the firstborn, the creator, the one who's before all things, the sustainer, the head of the church, the preeminent one, the fullness of God, the peacemaker, the reconciler. He is the one, the Christ, that Paul is speaking of when he says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now notice that phrase at the end of verse 27, Christ in you. Not Christ upon you, but in you. Not Christ beside you, but in you. Not Christ above you, but in you. Not Christ around you, but in you. Not Christ who is with you, but in you. Not Christ who is near you, but in you. Christ in you. Now you think on that a bit. And he's not talking about Christ in Paul or Christ in the saints or Christ in the apostles, or Christ in the ministers, or Christ in the priests, or Christ in the teachers, or Christ in the spiritual giants. He's talking about Christ in you, the smallest believer, the youngest believer, the feeblest believer, the weakest, even the most carnal believer. Whatever your spiritual state and status, if you are saved, if you've been born again by God's grace, Christ is in you. That's why the children sing, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, Christ in us. And why Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Christ is always on the outside until that day when in faith, we see ourselves as sinners and see him as a savior and say, yes, Lord, I need you to come into my life and save me from my sin and give me the gift of eternal life and do what you want to do in my life. Make me what you want me to be. Invite him into our life. And he comes in and Christ is in you. Now that's part of the ministry, mystery that Paul is speaking of. That you, even if you are not a Jew, you have Christ in you. Now look at that in a couple other places just to make it sure, clear. Romans chapter 8, verse 10. <coughs> Romans 8, 10, Paul says, And if, and in Greek we call that a first class condition, which is the same as the idea of since, if Christ be in you, which he is, Christ in you. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Verse 5, examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not that your own selves, how that Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Either Christ is in you or you're a reprobate, a lost sinner. John said, he that has the Son has life. And he that has not the Son of God has not life. If you do not have Jesus Christ dwelling in you, you're lost, eternally lost. You're headed for an awful eternity. You need him to come into your life and save you and make you one of his. Examine yourself. Make sure he's there. And Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. Here's Paul praying that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Christ dwelling in your hearts. You put your faith in him and he dwells in your hearts. Now Christ, the verse says, our text says, Christ in you. And I mean, and Paul means, and the scripture means Christ 
in all his fullness. Look in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him, that is in Jesus Christ, should all fullness dwell. Fullness of what? Colossians chapter 2 verse 9. For in him, that is in Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All the fullness of God, that is, all the power of God all the wisdom of God, all the holiness of God, all the attributes of God are fully in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ dwells in you. Amen. Now it's not the idea of Christ that is in you. It's not belief in Christ he's talking about. It's not a little piece of Christ that is in you, but Christ in all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in you. And since he is the omnipresent God, all of him can be in you, and all of him can be in every other believer as well. Now, if you had 10 quart jars empty and one quart jar full, and this jar is full, and you want to pour it into these other jars and fill them up, it won't work. If you take this full one and dump it in that one, then that one is full, but you don't have any put in the other ones. But Christ... All the fullness of God is in him, and he dwells in every believer. Now, if Christ dwells in us, which he does, if you're a believer, Christ dwells in you, then how can we fear if Christ dwells within us? How can we be timid? If Christ dwells in us, how can we get discouraged? If Christ dwells in us, how can we yield to sin? If Christ dwells in us, how can we be afraid to witness to someone if Christ and all his power dwells in us? How can we even fear death if Christ is in us? How can we be sorrowing if Christ dwells within us? We need to reflect on these things. Christ, the creator, the king of the universe, dwells in me and in you. Oh, you could think on that for a long time, and we would never quite wear it out. Now, Christ, our text, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, that word hope, two ideas to hope. One idea says hope is wishful thinking. Like, I hope I win the lottery someday. I don't hope so because I don't play it. But if somebody says, I, I hope I win the lottery, that's wishful thinking. You're not going to, in case you didn't know that. Uh, that's, uh, that's one meaning. That's the common meaning of hope. We just wishfully think something might happen. But the uh, more scriptural meaning of hope is expectation. This will happen. I'm expecting it. 75 years ago, you girls listen to this. 75 years ago, a young woman would have a hope chest. Maybe some still do. I don't know. I don't think so, probably. But they'd have a hope chest. They'd have a nice chest, and they would start putting things in there because someday they were going to get married. They want to be equipped. And so they'd put a, a fancy quilt in there or some doilies or some a tableware or some tablecloths or linens and all those things because someday they were going to get married and they were going to need all those things. And they called it a hope chest. I guess they could have called it an expectation chest because they really thought, they were convinced, certainly they will get married someday and have a family that was just uh, the goal. Now, all young people don't have that goal nowadays, but in those days they did. And so they had a hope chest. That was hope with the idea of expectation. And that's the way it's used in Scripture. When Scripture refers to our hope, it's not talking about wishful thinking. It's talking about our expectation. Paul says in Romans 5, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's not wishful thinking. That's expectation. Romans 15, we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. 
Romans 15. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Now he's not the God of wishful thinking. He's the God of expectations, hope. 1 Corinthians 15, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Expectation. Galatians chapter 5. We through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And that's not the wishful thinking of righteousness. That's the expectation. Colossians 1.5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. You don't have any wishful thinkings laid up in heaven. You have hope. First, First Thessalonians, Paul talks about the helmet, the hope of salvation. That's the expectation of the salvation we're saved out of this world someday. 2 Thessalonians 2, our Lord Jesus Christ has given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Hope, not wishful thinking. Titus 1, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Hope, expectation of eternal life, not wishful thinking. A lot of people have wishful thinking about, oh, I, I hope I get to heaven someday. Uh, I think I might make it. I'll try real hard. That's all wishful thinking. The only hope of heaven is the sure hope that comes through faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Titus 3, 7, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And that's not the wishful thinking of eternal life. That's the expectation of eternal life. Hebrews 6, we who have fled for refuge to lay, up, lay hold upon the hope set before us. And Hebrews 6, 19, which hope we have is an anchor of the soul. Wishful thinking isn't much of an anchor. But our expectation is an anchor of the soul. Sure and steadfast. 1 Peter 3, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you. Expectation that we have. Christ in you is not wishful thinking about glory. Christ in you is the hope of glory, the expectation of glory. And Christ prayed for this, that Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ prayed for that. Look with me at John chapter 17. Christ's great high priestly prayer for his disciples just before he left this world. John chapter 17, verse 24, he's praying to his father for his disciples. And he says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. Oh, the greatest thing, Jesus said, is for my disciples to get into heaven and behold the glory of God. And that's why Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Moses prayed, remember, there on the mountain, Lord, show me your glory. And Peter said, when his glory is revealed, we shall rejoice. And the songwriter says, look, ye saints, the sight is glorious. Now, there's a lot of glorious sights in this world. I've seen some of them. We're going out to Vermont tomorrow to see the leaves and hopefully the rain and the wind won't blow them off the trees and the sun will shine. It'll be a glorious thing to see all those trees on the mountains covered with all the colors. That'll be glorious. And uh, some of you, as I have stood on the edge of the Grand Canyon, looked at all that gash in the earth and all those layers of stone monuments and what a glorious sight that is. And I've stood by the Taj Mahal in India and seen those white pillars, perfect symmetry, reflecting in those ponds. Glorious sight. And I remember flying past the peak of Mount Everest in the Himalayas. That peak standing up there, what a glorious sight. But the most glorious thing that you and I will ever see is that day when we catch our first sight of the glory of God. That's our hope. 
And the only way we have that hope is because Christ dwells within us. Christ in you is the hope of glory. And if Christ does not dwell in your heart, you have no hope of glory. You're lost. Not because you're not a Baptist or you don't go to this church or something. Because Christ is the source of life. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. If we have him, we have life. And we have that certain expectation, that hope of glory. But if Christ does not dwell in your heart, you're lost and without Christ and without hope. But thank God, Christ dwells in us and gives us that hope, that expectation of glory, the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Shall we pray? Father, we cannot begin to comprehend the fact that you, almighty God, in the person of Christ, dwell within us. You are this treasure in these earthen vessels of these old, feeble, sinful bodies we have. And yet by your grace, you've chosen to dwell in us. And because of your presence with us, give us that hope of that glory which shall be revealed someday when we stand there at the gate of heaven and look in and see the glory of God. O oh Lord, we pray that we might live as we ought in this world and that we might reflect some of the glory of God to those around us, that they might see a little bit of Christ in us. And so, Lord, bless these thoughts to our heart, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.